And good afternoon. My name is Julie Rendelman. I'm going to be your host for the next two hours. Um, uh, there's been a bombshell um, information regarding the uh, settlement of Jeffrey Epstein with uh, Bat Bradley Eb Edwards, and we've been covering that for the past hour. And in a few minutes, we're going to be hearing from Lewis Frankel, a press conference out of Florida. Um, before we do that, we have Natalie Jackson uh, still with us. Natalie, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, Natalie, we were talking earlier about um, this settlement. And one of the things I know that I had raised, and I know we wanted to talk about this more, is how does a settlement where the victims don't get an opportunity to speak, um, how does that impact them? Is it a good thing for them? Is it a bad thing for them? Is it a good thing for the system? Right. I think one of the reasons that we have victim rights laws is because um, victims do need to have an opportunity to speak and tell their side of the story. When you have settlements, um, many times the victims are denied. That's why in Florida, even in a settle, even in a plea offer, usually at sentencing, victims can speak. So in this case, I'm not sure if that happened, but I do know that these are young ladies who went against very, very powerful men. So it can be really scary, and you think about you know what could happen in the future for you. So I hope these young ladies are taking care of themselves. Uh, you know, the irony is, is that the, the case itself, this civil case, wasn't in regards to the victims. It was actually between Bradley Edwards, the attorney, and Mr. Epstein. So that does change things a little bit. The uniqueness of it was is that many victims who had never had an opportunity to be heard all those years ago were going to get an opportunity to speak. And so, you know, I wonder, you, we're going to go to a, to a clip in a moment, um, and um, we can check back in and talk about that. It was passion. And I walked it in and I handed the pleading in to the lady who was at the desk. Courtney Wilde was right outside, ready at the time. She told me, this is an emergency. And I told the clerk, I want a hearing. And she said, when? I said, now. What's going on is wrong. I want it now. And she took it back to her boss and she came back and said, you don't get a hearing now. It doesn't even say emergency on this first pleading. I said, give me that paper back. I hand wrote emergency on it and handed it right back to her. It was an emergency then. Judge Mara treated it like an emergency then. We got right into court after I got laughed at by the clerk. But if you go back to docket entry number one on the CVRA case, there's handwritten emergency and that's how that happened. From that day, we've treated that like an emergency. It's taken a really, really, really long time to get here. But now we're past the, the sideshow of what was allegations Jeffrey Epstein made against me that he's now said were categorically false. We can focus now back on the people that we care about and who need our help. That's our clients. And we're about to go into uh, why, see a press conference of Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Lewis Frankel. She is out of Florida. She's going to be giving a press conference, I believe, in regards to the Epstein Bradley Edwards case. Um, we don't have sound yet, so we can actually talk to uh, Ms. Jackson a little more um, if I still have you with me, Natalie. I am. Thanks, Julie. Um, I do want to ask you, I mean, one of the things that came up while we have a moment um, in regards to the Epstein case that seemed to be a, a, of issue was, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that when Epstein moved from Florida to New York, he was required to register as a sex offender. And one of the big explosive issues that had arisen is that the New York County District Attorney's Office had requested he register as a lower sex offender than what was appropriate. Um, and so you know, there were some questions as to whether or not, just like you talked about before, when those in power can afford to hire, you know, expensive attorneys who know people, whether or not kind of that, you know, is, is one of those things that concerns you when we hear about, you know, the New York County District Attorney's Office asking for a lower sex offender status for what everyone deems to be a predator pedophile. But yes, it would concern me. All these um, actions that happened to Mr. Epstein, it seems like they're all a actions that happened with privilege. We have, he had a plea deal that was unprecedented. Precedent. He had, you know, he's now being able to register as a lower um, classification as a sex offender. So, and his status and his power, his money, we'd have to question whether or not those played a part. And if someone who did not have the status and the money, would they have been afforded the same privileges that he has been given? And that is what, when we look at justice, those are the things that we have to measure. 
So just and just to clarify, he at the end of the day, he it did in fact was required to register as a sex offender three. I believe he appealed, and at that time, the New York County District Attorney's Office acknowledged that they had made a mistake and had a lack of understanding of the law at that time. However, um, I agree with you. I think that there is a question to be asked, and that question is, is if an individual in his circumstance did not have the high-powered attorneys behind him, would he have that chance? We're, we're going to head back into uh, see the press conference right now of Lewis Frankel, Congresswoman out of Florida. Uh, I know there's been a lot of interest in this Epstein case. You probably already are familiar with the facts, but I'm just going to go through some of them, and then I'm going to tell you uh, what my role is going to be here. Uh, as, a, as a result of, of, of current Miami Herald report and past Palm Beach, po re, re, Palm Beach Post reports, as well as some recent litigation, which was just settled this morning, it's come to the attention of the public of what I call a very shocking uh, sexual exploitation of young vulnerable women here in Palm Beach County. Investigation held in the early 2000s by the Palm Beach police of a uh, Jeffrey Epstein who lived over in Palm Beach and uh, allegedly uh, had dozens and dozens of young vulnerable women uh, young women t taken to his house uh, uh, where they were sexually exploited. Uh, I think what is e has been equally shocking is what I call an extreme minimal uh, punishment for this man without really any public uh, explanation as to why this happened. Uh, the, a deal was struck, I'm going to read what it was, a deal was struck by uh, the Southern Florida U.S. Attorney Alexandria Acosta, who is now our Secretary of Labor. And basically, uh, this was an extraordinary plea agreement that actually shielded uh, the, ex the full extent of the crimes that were committed. Uh, Ms. Epstein ended up serving 13 months here in Palm Beach County on some type of work release program uh, after he had been facing what seemed, was apparently a, a 53 count indict page, a 53-page federal indictment that could have put him into prison for life. We do not know, although it's been reported that maybe he was giving information to the federal government, we do not know if that is true, and we do really not know the reason for what I, what I again, what I call was, I thought, an extreme minimal punishment. Uh, there apparently were accomplices. They also have been shielded. There was a, uh, a Crime Victims' Right Act, which would have entitled the victims for a, a notification, notification. That apparently was also violated. Uh, so uh, I know there are ongoing uh, litig litigation, uh, but I want to tell you that um, a number of uh, members, the entire uh, Democratic delegation, the Florida delegation, as well as a number of other members of Congress, have has written a letter, uh, which I want to, this is what I'm going to, if I can find it, I'm going to tell you what it says. Yes. Sure, you want to get a little closer? Okay. We wrote a letter that was sent out yesterday to the Inspector General of the United States Justice Department, dear Inspector General Horowitz. We want to write to express great concerns of the reports that during his tenure as United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida, the current Secretary of Labor, Alex Acosta, gave a non-prosecution deal to a wealthy and well-connected serial sex offender, hid it from victims, and granted immunity to any potential co-conspirators who were involved in the crimes. According to recently obtained documents, the individual to whom uh, the Secretary Acosta uh, provided the non-prosecution deal was Jeff Jeffrey Epstein, who was facing a 53-page indictment that could have resulted in life imprisonment for trafficking minor girls for sex parties. Uh, rather than pursue the indictment fully to ensure the individual could never prey again on minor girls, Secretary Acosta entered into an extremely a preferential deal that resulted in the perpetrator of horrific crimes against children serving just 13 
months in the county jail. The non-prosecution deal also had the effect of shutting down a Federal Bureau investigation examination of whether there were more victims and astonishingly granted immunity to co-conspirators. As members of Congress intent on ensuring the equal application of justice and gravely concerned with the plague of sex trafficking and sexual abuse, we urge you to conduct an investigation into the circumstances surrounding the non-prosecution agreement Mr. Costa entered into with Mr. Epstein. It also appears that numerous related case files and court documents are heavily redacted and court documents uh, uh, well beyond the reasonable protections accorded to victims and confidential informants. This lack of public transparency further necess necessitates an internal review. In uh, conduct of such an investigation, we urge you to review whether any Department of Justice policies, procedures, or practices were violated and what, if any, violations were committed uh, by the then U.S. Attorney and current Secretary of Labor, uh, uh, Acosta. Uh, I, I, I want to add this. If the Justice Department does not uh, move forward uh, with an investigation that, uh, that I, uh, along with many of my colleagues, will take this to the appropriate oversight committees, be it the, the Judiciary Committee, the Oversight Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, or any committee that, is, that deals with uh, the trafficking of minors and the judicial system. And I'll, ju I'll just take questions. We have your letter here, but are you calling for a cost to resign? No, I'm not today. We're calling for an investigation. What are you hoping the outcome of that investigation? Should he be removed as Labor Secretary? Well, yeah, we're, we're hoping for transparency. I mean, it, it is such a shocking plea agreement. Uh, I guess the question that arises, why did that happen? That has not been, uh, I don't believe that has been brought forth to the public in a satisfactory manner. Maybe there is a reason that we do not know, uh, but we feel like the public wants to know, especially since, you know, uh, especially I would say here in Palm Beach County, where uh, we put a sex offender back on the street. Does the term drain the swamp relate to this situation? I think time will tell, and we think there should be an investigation that will let us know. So you've written the Inspector General this is at the Justice Department. And so you want some answers? Yes. And potentially the congressional committees? Yes. Committee. Well, we're going to see what the response is. If we feel that there is a good faith investigation, uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, if not, uh, I will make a request to our oversight committees uh, to pursue this matter. Let me ask you this way. If it was someone other than Epstein in the same situation facing the same charges, would the result have been the same? Well. You know, that's the question we want to get to. I think what, what the unknown is, did, did Epstein provide s some kind of information? I mean, was he given a, f a favor, this v very favorable deal because of his stature, his wealth, his contacts, or is there something more to it? And I think that's what we want to get to the bottom of. Anything else? Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that was just the press conference of Congresswoman Lewis Frankel. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. And those are the incredibly uh, dramatic words of Bradley Edwards uh, after he found out that the, uh, after a settlement was made between himself and Jeffrey Epstein. And one of the things he talks about is the fact that had they gone to trial, that the victims, in a sense, would have been a distraction um, and that the focus of this case really was about Epstein um, and what Epstein had done to Mr. Edwards. And so, the, you know, obviously the question um, that is raised is, you you know, would the complainants be satisfied that a settlement took place or are the complainants not satisfied because they don't get another op yet another opportunity to have their voices heard in a courtroom? Um, and so, you know, as part of the settlement, Jeffrey Epstein agreed uh, to make a pretty telling statement uh, to Brad Edward, Bradley Edwards, a, a mea culpa, if you will. And I'm going to read that to you. That is. Uh, these are the quotes of uh, the words of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, While Mr. Edwards was representing clients against me, 
I filed a lawsuit against him in which I made allegations about him that the evidence conclusively proves were absolutely false. The truth was that his aggressive investigation and litigation style was highly effective and therefore troublesome for me. The lawsuit I filed was my unreasonable attempt to damage his business reputation and cause Mr. Edwards to stop pursuing cases against me. It did not work. Despite my efforts, he continued to do an excellent job for his clients and through his relentless pursuit held me responsible. I am now admitting that I was wrong and that the things I said to try to harm Mr. Edwards' reputation as a trial lawyer were false. I sincerely apologize for the false and hurtful allegations I made and hope some forgiveness for my acknowledgement of wrongdoing signed Jeffrey Epstein. And as uh, you may or may not know, this was not read by Jeffrey Epstein. It was read by the lawyer on behalf of Jeffrey Epstein. And I have uh, Natalie Jackson here with me uh, to talk about this a little bit further. You know, uh, Natalie, what do you, what do you think about the uh, mea culpa from uh, Jeffrey Epstein with regards to uh, this subject? Settlement. I think that Attorney Edwards definitely won. Um, in this case, I, you know, with the settlement and with that letter, and the fact that Attorney Edwards is being able to speak so publicly about this case and the settlement lets me know that um, Mr. Epstein was very, very worried about this trial and very, very worried about the Miami Herald's investigation and news coverage of this trial. Yeah, and, and actually, that it's a great point. I know you practice in Florida. A am I correct that many of these civil settlements usually result in both sides not being able to speak about what happened? Yes, usually there's a confidentiality agreement, and there's also an agreement that neither side is admitting wrongdoing. So for Mr. Epstein to come out and admit wrongdoing, um, for Mr. Edwards to be able to give this long press conference where he's talking about this case, I mean, it's really extraordinary. And it lets me know that Epstein and his attorneys and possibly people who are involved with this case did not want this to be in a long, week-long news cycle. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, in a sense, I think this settlement was made for that very reason. But one wonders if the fact that there is a settlement is actually causing even more of an explosion because now we have Congresswoman, which we'll talk about further, Congresswoman Lewis Frankel stepping out and giving a press conference where she's saying that she demands and the, con the Congress demands for the Justice Department to further investigate why it was that Jeffrey Epstein got such an incredible deal all those years ago and whether or not there was any type of potential prosecutorial misconduct. And so, you know, one wonders if it really at the end of the day makes a difference if he if he settled or didn't settle. It seems like the cat is out of the bag. Well, I think that, you know, yes, I agree with that. But a lot of times with victims and when people are going to testify, if there are further lawsuits, then you can you have an opportunity the defendant would have an opportunity to settle with those other victims. So, and and then require a confidentiality agreement. I don't know if that happened in this case, but perhaps that is happening behind the scenes as we speak or has happened previously. Excellent point. Um, we're going to step in and we're going to just take a look back at the Acosta uh, confirmation hearings. And what's notable, and I want you to listen, is the questions that were asked of Mr. Acosta, Acosta in regards to the Jeffrey Epstein investigation. Let's take a look. A couple of questions. My understanding is that there is a pending civil lawsuit filed by a couple of the uh, victims in that case uh, seeking to argue that they should have been given notice uh, prior to the plea deal being entered into. Is that your understanding as well? Um, the, my understanding is that there is a pending civil lawsuit. The Department of Justice has uh, defended the actions of the office in that matter under both President Bush and President Obama's administrations. The opening that I read suggests that you decided as U.S. Attorney to cut a non-prosecution deal. Uh, that part of the decision was that that non-prosecution deal be held private, not appear in the public record. And there's an allegation that I just read that um, you did not pursue a federal indictment, even though your staff had advocated that you do so. Is that accurate? Um, that is not accurate. Let me um, let me address the um, you know and the um, you know one of the difficulties with uh, matters before the Department of Justice is that. Um, the Department of Justice does not litigate in the public record or in the media and litigates in court. 
um, um, I, uh, let me set forth some facts. Um, this matter was originally a state case. It was presented by the state attorney to the grand jury in Palm Beach County. The grand jury in Palm Beach County recommended a single count of solicitation not involving minors, I believe, and that would have resulted in zero jail time, zero registration as a sexual offender, and zero restitution for the victims in this case. Um, the matter um, was uh, then presented to the U.S. Attorney's Office. It is highly unusual, and as I was speaking to some of your colleagues um, that, that have been involved in, in prosecutions, they, they mentioned that they don't know of any cases personally where a U.S. attorney becomes involved in a matter after it has already gone to a grand jury at the state level. Um, in this case, we deemed it um, necessary to become involved, and um, we early on uh, had discussions within the office. Was that a consensus decision in your office? It was a broadly held decision, I, yes. I'm over my time, Mr. Chair, and I'll... Uh, I may come back to this in a second. And you just heard uh, from, that was uh, Mr. Acosta speaking at the confirmation hearings um, in regards to his recollection of what occurred um, all those years ago in regards to the prosecution of Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and as you know, Jeffrey Epstein uh, settled today with uh, Bradley Edwards and um, made a fairly uh, um, made a statement um, indicating that everything Bradley Edwards had done with regards to the investigation of these young women was right and that he was wrong to have pursued him um, in any type of litigation. Um, and if we're, we're going to take a break, um, and when we come back, we're actually going to go back um, to look back at some of the um, police officer cover-up trial that we've been covering. There's going to be live testimony at about 2 p.m., um, and so we're going to get back into that, talk a little bit about it, and get you back on track with that. Um, and we'll be back in a few minutes. And that's Sergeant Larry Snelling testifying in regards to the use of force. He had an opportunity to review the dash cam that all of us have seen multiple times in regards to the shooting death of Laquan McDonald. Um, and he's testifying in regards to uh, whether or not uh, there was appropriate force used or excessive force used at the time of uh, this incident. And I'm going to bring back in Natalie Jackson, who is a, a an attorney out of Florida. Um, thank you for sticking with us, Natalie. Um, and e one of the questions I have is, you know, the officers that are on trial right now are not on trial for using excessive force. They're on trial for lying about what occurred on that day. And so the question really is, how is this witness relevant uh, to coming to the conclusion as to whether or not these officers lied, and not only whether they lied, but whether they got together to lie? I think this witness is relevant in the fact that, well, for two different reasons. One, one reason is whether or not who filled out the use of force reports and how did they fill them out. There's allegations that um, the defendants filled out reports saying that Mr. McDonald uh, used force against Officer Van Dyke. Um, and I think this witness is here to testify to what type of force was appropriate given the, given the incident of Mr. Man Van Dyke and um, whether or not Officer Van Dyke should have used um, deadly force and, what, and who should have filled out the reports and how the report should have been filled out. So I do think he's a relevant witness here um, because I, it's my understanding that Officer Van Dyke did not fill out a report and Officer Wash did. So I think that's why we're here. Yeah, I think that there was some question, and obviously I don't work out of Florida, but there were out of the state. But it, one of the questions was whether or not um, you know everyone is supposed to fill out the use, use of force reports. One person is supposed to fill it out, um, you know, and so and that somehow because someone else filled out the report, that therefore that meant that there was some type of conspiracy um, to to write a false report, or or to just cover up what actually happened. Got it. Um, all right, we're going to take a short break, um, and we'll be back with you. 
And uh, I want to bring in Natalie Jackson. She's a criminal uh, attorney, civil rights attorney out of Florida. And, you know, basically what Sergeant Snelling is testifying to um, is that, you know, those officers, after at least his viewpoint of looking at the dash can, at least Officer McDonald, I'm sorry, not Officer, um, excuse me, um, Mr. Van Dyke did not need uh, to use uh, deadly force in order to stop Laquan McDonald. Um, and I guess the reason this is so important is because the officers that eventually wrote out their reports indicated that there was more violence or potential violence coming from on behalf of Laquan McDonald than actually did occur. Uh, what's your take on that, Natalie? Absolutely. That's why um, this use of force expert is up there testifying. He's testifying that, um, number one, the there was no, uh, from his perspective on the film, there was no assault by um, Laquan McDonald. And he also testified that there was no um, battery. And both in these officers' report, they reported that Laquan McDonald um, assaulted and injured them. He's also pointing out the fact that um, Officer Walsh did not, did not need to fill out a report. So this was a deliberate, um, this was a deliberate attempt of Officer Walsh to say a falsity against Laquan McDonald. But, so don't, but, but don't officers fill out reports all the time that they don't have to fill out? I mean, is that in and of itself enough to make out a criminal liability on behalf of Mr. Walsh or Officer, or officer Walsh? Use of force um, forms are for that specific officer, whether or not force was used on them. So, yes, I, I think that that is very important in this case. And that's what Officer Snelling is there to testify to. Sure. And I think one of the questions, you know, that I assume will and did come out on cross is the fact that, you know, that we, we can't view this in a vacuum. And instead, it's not just what's on the dash cam, but arguably what happened with regards to Laquan McDonald before um, the dash cam came on. Although I think no matter how we look at it, at the end of the day, there's still no um, plausible explanation why they wrote the word battery, um, because none of the officers were battered in any way, shape, or form. We're going to take a break, um, and we'll go back into the live courtroom at about 2 o'clock. Thank you so much. And good afternoon and welcome back. Uh, we're going to be heading live into the courtroom on the bench trial of Thomas Gaffney, David March, and Joseph Walsh. These are three police officers that are accused of a cover-up in regards to the shooting death of a young man by the name of Laquan McDonald. I want to uh, start by thanking Natalie Jackson. She was with us for, for a couple of hours and took the time out of her day from Orlando, Florida. Um, to talk about some important cases, including the Jeffrey Epstein case and the case we're talking about now. I want to thank you so much for uh, bringing your legal expertise to law and crime, and we hope to have you back really soon. Thanks, Julie. I hope to be back. Great. Um, and uh, so we're going to be going back into the courtroom. As, the, as you know, um, Thomas Gaffney, David March, and Joseph Walsh are accused of a cover-up. What does that mean? That means that the three of them are accused of acting together um, to make false reports to try to cover up for the actions of Jason Van Dyke. As you may or may not know, Jason Van Dyke um, was accused and later convicted of uh, the shooting death of Laquan McDonald, who was a young man who the officer had confronted on the street after Laquan McDonald had uh, done some damage with a knife, including um, broken uh, some car windows and damaged a tire. Um, and so Jason Van Dyke was found guilty of the murder. These three officers are accused of covering up by making false statements in police reports indicating that various things happened that actually did not happen. Um, and so we've been waiting for uh, the court uh, to begin again. We heard from some of the prior testimony from some of the prosecution witnesses who the prosecutor um, believes um, will support um, their claim beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, before we get back into the room um, to hopefully hear live testimony, we're going to be hearing from top crimes from Anthony Velez. <laughs> 